This is the Data Download, your guide to upping your game when it comes to managing and accessing data in your organization. Hi, everybody. Uh, Stan uh, from uh, Colibra, and we're here with the Data Download again. Uh, and today we're very honored to have Peep over from uh, Monese. We're going to talk about data quality, amongst other things. Uh, but before we dive in, uh, Pape, maybe a, a few words about yourself for the audience. Hello, I'm Pape working as a data architect, and I'm really interested in data quality and really happy to uh, meet with Stan to talk about data quality and related aspects today. Looking forward to it. You know, you're working as a data architect today, but in the past you've done many other things and you've been in data for quite a while, it seems. So could you in maybe give us a little bit of your data history? I stepped into data worry at the same time when I enrolled to university. It was more than 10 years ago. So there was uh, one research institute working on AI and uh, they were looking for research engineer. That was my first experience with one of the largest data sets I had before. And data has been my passion ever since. I have been in different roles. I have been doing database maintenance. I have been designing data models. I have been breaking databases and putting them together Debugging them. <laughs> I have been working as a as data scientist, also as a team lead, working in in academia, in industry, in governmental se sector as well. So, wide variety of uh, topics related to data I have been working with. And if you take um, the Dama principles, which is uh, let's say many people are following, then uh, or a framework, then I would say that uh, it's hard to find any. Uh, Data discipline, I haven't been actually had uh, any any hands-on uh, experience. Wow. Wow. So, so that's yeah. quite, a, yeah. quite a history in data. If you've touched all the points of the Dharma wheel, then you've come a long way. So you've now ended up at your current company, Moniz. Can you tell us a little bit about mm. uh, the organization? What does it do? What is its business? And maybe why is data important there? So Bonis itself is a leading pan-European fintech. It offers smart money services to millions of consumers across Europe. It also offers uh, virtual and physical cards and combines them with mobile payment services. As any fintech, it's highly regulated. So it's really important to um, set focus on the data. And I think we are coming back to later. Data really helps to uh, ensure compliance in many settings as well. Great deal. Absolutely. So it's essentially, you could even say as a fintech, it's maybe even a digital native. So data is very, very important to making sure that everything runs from compliance to everything else in the organization, probably. Yeah, data is a key. And it has been, I think, uh, very um, essential to financial sector always. I mean, uh, data has been key in, let's say, uh, helping to provide uh, different financial services, starting from, let's say, financial instruments to, let's say, payments. Yeah, it's how to do finance without data, you know? <laughs> it's impossible, I think. <laughs> Obviously, uh, data is important uh, in a fintech, right? It's part of the business, uh, as we said. I want to figure out, okay, when and how did the organization say, okay, our data quality is bad, we have to do something about it? So, first of all, the thing with data quality man uh, management is that it's like going to a gym. It's wise to start before, let's say, you're able to do any exercises. So, I think any, any sensible company you have seen, they really think about uh, the data quality aspects as well. Another thing about uh, related to a gym is that... Uh, you hardly see any, any results after your first visit. So you need to do it continuously. And then you start seeing your effect in a while. So I think our starting point was not really about bad data quality, but it was more about, let's say, because we wanted to, let's say, improve our shape. I uh, think that this is a very popular thing to go to the gym, yes. Uh, the gym is <laughs> well visited, <laughs> but essentially you're seeing uh, in the industry as a whole, I would say, there's an, an uptick of data quality. Uh, there's an uptick of data observability, partially driven by the digital transformation, which we've been seeing, partially happening because of cloud transformation, you know, because people move their... Uh, data from the attic to the cloud, so they might as well clean it up while they do that. Uh, so that is another driver, and AI is a big driver because you're clearly seeing that recognition in the market. 
uh, okay, if you want to have a valuable AI, we need to give it valuable uh, data. Uh, so we are seeing a, a big interest uh, in data quality. You're, uh, you also have to split it up into what you see, I think, because oftentimes, you know, something goes wrong in the business and they have a bad dashboard or a bad report or whatever. And then they say, oh, it's because of bad data quality. And then they um, sometimes do an initiative. Let's clean it up, right? Let's do a cleanup activity. That's a data quality activity. But those data quality activities don't always result in sustainable practices. I think that's where you cross over from data quality into data governance, uh, making sure there's a framework, there's responsibilities, there's process so that data quality can actually become a repeatable and sustainable activity rather than a one-time cleanup job. Uh, it's exactly like you're saying, right? You don't go to the gym once to get fit or to get in shape. You go to the gym for the rest of your life uh, because that's part of a healthy body. So thanks for the metaphor. We're going to keep using that for sure. For you, what do you think a data quality framework looks like? People have been working in data quality, let's say, for past 20, 30 years, even more. So different frameworks have been proposed. One of the things that I often really see is that when people are talking about data quality, they are mixing together different dimensions or let's say different aspects of data quality. I think it's having, let's say, clear understanding what are specific parts of a data quality framework and let's say uh, how you use them in order to have clarity there, to have, let's say, better usage of data quality in general. So in our case, what we consider as part of the data quality framework is that there are roles and processes, but uh, there are separate, in our case, we have a separate uh, processes for um, data quality measurement, data quality resolution, and data quality rule management. And it actually, everything starts from data quality rule management because data quality rules are the mechanisms which help you define, let's say, how you measure data quality. Without data quality rules, it's pretty hard to talk about data quality per se. So pros and processes uh, are important part of data governance framework. Then um, having a data quality model, or let's say data quality asset model, that's another important part. So in our case, what we are doing is, um, as part of data governance, we have defined a variety of assets what, uh, what are describing different phases of data and uh, data related uh, business object. In case of data quality asset model, I would outline maybe the most important things are business rules and, uh, and data quality rules. They are tightly coupled because business rule describes a business understanding of data requirements and other requirements, uh, which may eventually lead up in data and data quality rules, they describe the data part. But I mean, they are coupled to each other. So one is more like, let's say, uh, IT view to a data, another is like a business view to a business. If you link them together, you link actually IT with business. And that's a wonderful thing. I mean, beautiful thing starts happening if actually business understands IT and IT understands uh, the business. But in our case, business rules, data quality rules, data quality measurements, which uh, tell you in which extent your um, data uh, complies to specific business requirements are there. And also data assets for, uh, let's say, physical layer, uh, logical layer, conceptual layer of, uh, of the data objects that you have there. So these are kind of the core parts or entities in, uh, in data quality asset model. And if you have, let's say, that asset model in place, so you know what are those entities you collect data about and you, you need to document in order to systematically implement data quality management, then uh, you need to measure it as well. So you, you want to keep uh, track of, let's say, how well your data quality management initiatives are performing. So you need to select uh, at the business level, what are those key dimensions you, uh, you measure uh, data quality uh, about. And for those data quality dimensions in the literature, if you're looking for, let's say, Tama literature, then they have identified more than 60 different uh, data quality dimensions. 60, okay. But if you start at the organization with data quality, you, you typically, you don't have a capability to handle all those, let's say variety, different varieties. So you need to focus yourself. And in our case, uh, what we have focused you is uh, validity, completeness, uniqueness, and uh, retention period as well, which is maybe not very often mentioned. It has very specific meaning. 
helps to report data compliance with respect to certain regulations very well. Well, you mentioned a lot of things there, Pape, in the um, data quality framework. So before we um, continue with exploring what the overall framework looks like, I heard, for example, you said uh, it's based on, on Dama and there's like 60 dimensions there, right? So we could talk about it forever. But th the data quality dimensions is one of the elements of the framework. You mentioned roles. So I'm definitely going to come back to that one. You mentioned processes, like, for example, data quality resolution or data quality measurements, right? You mentioned specifically measurements. You mentioned business rules uh, to represent the understanding or the requirements of the business. You mentioned the data rules. And you also mentioned, and I also thought that was interesting, how these can actually serve as a bridge to make sure that the business and the IT understand one another uh, when it comes to agreements about data. For you, if you look at a process like, for example, data quality measurements, what roles would be involved there? So the thing with data quality measurement is that ideally you would love to automate it as much as possible. So you have described already data quality rules. They are typically executable in your systems. So you want to make sure that, let's say, uh, but you want to make sure that somebody takes care of that system. So you have a lot of engineering roles, making sure that data quality ro uh, rules are deployed in your um, systems where you're doing data quality monitoring. And also what you need to do is you need somebody who will uh, transform those measurements into business insights. So you typically need a business analyst who will actually comply in, or be an analyst, who will make a nice dashboard where you can see your key metrics and uh, other details which are important to understand how well you are doing in a gym, you know? <laughs> so, but, but I think these are key roles there, but uh, let's say uh, other roles, they are maybe uh, more important in, uh, when you're designing business rules and, uh, and when, when you have, let's say, figured out that you have some data quality issues. Yeah, so essentially what you're saying is that uh, if I look at the gym of data quality and, you know, the trainer and some other roles that are there, you have represented this from the technical side, maybe data engineers, who help put some of those measurements in place. And a lot of those measurements, of course, happen in an automated fashion. Um, then you have uh, maybe, like you said, a BI analyst who's taking those measurements and maybe putting it together in a nice dashboard so that um, some stakeholder from the business can then you know, visit that dashboard maybe on a daily, weekly, some sort of frequency basis and say, okay, let me see how well my business process is doing based on, you know, whether the data is trending up or down in some sort of quality measure. Yeah. And, and you obviously mentioned the other stakeholders as well. So you're not building those reports for the sake of reports, but I mean, there are certain roles behind them as well. You have a data owner who has responsibility for ensuring that your health data is healthy. Ideally, you will have C-suite executives there as well who are really monitoring some high-level metrics. If you are a data-driven company, do you understand, let's say, whether um, the data occurrence or data quality management is performing as it's supposed to be? Yeah. Of course, yeah. So you have a roll-up even uh, to the managerial yeah. levels uh, so they can actually monitor, hey, we said we were going to get in shape, right? We, we, sh we said we were going to get uh, better quality data. Is this actually happening, right? Are people going to the gym? Are we doing the measurements? Are we doing the monitoring, etc.? Yeah, but let's say then it depends, let's say, on a company, whether they are part of a data quality measurement process or maybe some other process. Another aspect I wanted to uh, unpack also a little bit with you is what you said about the business and the IT, right? So you said in your asset model, there is the business requirement, the business rule uh, regarding the data, and there is the or technical uh, rule. Could you clarify that a little bit? It's not only business rules and data quality rules. Data quality rules are going to specific data assets, which are implementing uh, the data models which have been designed. And uh, then you have, let's say, uh, like you have specific tables and columns and uh, other assets. And from business side, well, you have business rules grouped into uh, standards, into policies related to other assets. So if you're actually are able to provide full lineage starting from your implementation into, let's say, uh, high-level documents as suggested by uh, maybe the management team of a company, 
well, you have a clear visibility of whether how well your IT and business are aligned. So you're uh, essentially getting better understanding uh, between the different stakeholders that are inevitably always involved, right? Uh, you're getting better collaboration. And as a whole, across your business, you're getting better transparency as well. Absolutely. So, I mean, often we hear questions like, where is our data? Or let's say there is maybe some doubt whether, let's say, business requirements really have been implemented, which is kind of, let's say, uh, linkage. You are really able to check it. doesn't matter whether your business sites, you want to make sure whether business requirements have been implemented or your right side to understand whether you have implemented proper business rules or business requirements. So um, is there any way that the value uh, of data quality is measured in your organization in the sense that the business says, okay, we, we want so much uh, business or we saved so much or we became more efficient? Are people actually tracking or making the bridge from the quality of your data to the business impact in that sense? It's typically still done in, in very old-fashioned way. So, I mean, you still need a business units to do it, which is good. There are things that machines are not very good at. And obviously, let's say, if you have business rules coming from your business unit, from, let's say, people who understand the business, then uh, they are obviously the best expert to evaluate um, what's a value or impact there as well. But of course, we are looking forward, I think, and you mentioned AI before as well, uh, to have some predictive models, which will uh, automate some of those tasks. You, you cannot, let's say, completely eliminate person from that process. But uh, let's say, if you can automate some of the routine tasks, providing some, let's say, rough estimates, what's a value to a business from data, that would be great. So that's something that I'm looking forward, actually. And probably sooner or later, we are going to stick into that theory as well. So starting to build the models, which will give initially maybe a rough estimate for a value, but why not to think about that those models could eventually get better and better. And well, we have full visibility of uh, data impact to a business as well. We are value. That would be a dream outcome, uh, but it takes putting the data yeah. quality framework together to get there in the first place, of course. Um, I believe one of the things we've done um, with our data quality component, we've actually seen that, uh, you know, in, in more traditional approaches, uh, there always was the drive starting from the business rule, right? And every business rule, every data rule had to be done by somebody. But what we are doing actually is we're automating a big portion of that already by looking at the data and the pattern in the data. And then you can sort of start to see, you know, well over a period of time, let's say a day or a week, it seems like there's really outliers in this data or, you know, the data seems to be going out of its regular bounds. And we've seen with, with certain customers that, half of the business rules that uh, were previously put together in an artisanal fashion, right? Hand coded, if you will, or handmade, that they can actually be automated by just like you said, a predictive analytics process that, that looks at the data. Um, we've already incorporated that and uh, that works really well. But exactly to your point, some part of the rules that the data has to match inevitably require a human input uh, because it requires a human decision to be made whether this data is good and that data is bad, right? Or the data has to comply to those rules. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, uh, we are legally not compliant for some reason, right? So some a human is always going to be in the loop for certain rules. But it is a, indeed amazing what uh, can already be done these days with uh, predictive analytics and other AI techniques. And now that we've touched on that topic uh, a few times, I think we have to bring it up, right? Everybody loves talking about AI these days. Uh, so maybe let's talk about it first a little bit genetically. Um, how are you looking at the AI summer and winter uh, today? There have been several winters already. I, some people are arguing it's a, it's a third one coming, maybe. I don't know. Definitely it's a summertime currently, at least in the field of AI. And... Um, I think uh, expectations are high, which is good if you, let's say, want to motivate people to, let's say, try out different errors or applications or approaches to AI. Let's say at the same time, uh, the main problem, which has not been solved, I would say, uh, 
beginning of 2000 when we saw, let's say, major shift into digital transformation, where people, let's say, started to migrate from paper into, into databases, is that there are still so many routine tasks that people are doing. And some of those are really obvious. So I think automating those tasks with AI or with something else, which seems to be doable today, and if this is done, then AI already has contributed a lot to, let's say, our well-being. But I'm not so much worried about, let's say, um, overusing AI. I mean, there are obvious applications where uh, the current algorithms are mature enough and uh, should be applied. But let's say uh, some things are left for future for another iteration. Maybe in 20 years, there is another AI summer coming up. And, uh, well, people see things from new angle, which was not possible today. We'll always have summers and winters, um, but I definitely agree with you that we're currently in a hot summer for AI. And I like what you said about uh, how it's automating some, you know, lower level activities that maybe are not very exciting in in in, in your job. So you can automate it now, which is great. Uh, you know, then you can focus on more value add activities like getting better data quality for the business, for example. And, you know, Absolutely. we've we've tried it out uh, also and inside of our software, for example, we said, okay, we can actually generate SQL with this, right? So now some of the business rules, you can literally just speak English to it and then it will try to translate that on the basis of the uh, knowledge graph of the metadata also into SQL that can immediately become one of those data rules and, and many other uh, automations. So it's quite exciting. But I want to focus on the data quality topic, of course, right? So AI is uh, very present right now, as you said, in a hot summer. And typically people say, if you want to have a better AI model, you need to give it better data, right? Uh, so the AI also has to go to the gym. Uh, what is your perspective there? I think very pragmatically. I mean, you you get the model which behaves exactly as the data. I mean, so if you take, for instance, the gym analog, then we are going to a world where, let's say, people are telling that uh, you are what you're eating. So I would say the same for AI and data as well. So you have what AI, I mean, what AI eats, that defines what AI. So if your AI eats, uh, eats crap, well, then you get, <laughs> as a result, crappy AI as well. Right, because, of course, the AI is um, trained on a certain data set, and it becomes some sort of representation of that data set. So if it's if there's low quality data in the data set, then it will be a lower quality model probably also. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to improve the data if you don't know any of requirements. I mean, it's the same with people as well. I mean, if you have not explicitly described requirements to the data, either in form of business rules, data, data quality rules, something else, well, I mean, how do you measure it? How do you understand whether data is good or bad? It's with AI as well. So, I mean, uh, how do you measure AI if you don't have requirements to AI? So, that actually brings to another topic, which is uh, AI requirements, AI governance, AI rules, something like that one, AI data rules, maybe. I don't know how to actually uh, describe them, but... That's a hot topic, probably. It's going to have a lot of answers. Oh, uh, absolutely. We're already seeing that AI governance topic um, increasing in interest uh, in the market, uh, and it's only getting started. So we're expecting a lot of activity around it. And maybe we should do a follow-up uh, podcast uh, a year from now or so. Um, but for now, let's stick with the data quality topic. So obviously, you know, better um, data quality, a better model, your work now on establishing better data quality across the organization, right? Establishing roles, ex establishing processes, establishing better collaboration and transparency is increasing um, systematically, like going to the gym every week, right? Systematically, it's improving the quality of your data across the organization. So ultimately, what you're doing today is also making your organization ready to make better use of AI tomorrow, next year, and three years from now, because there is better food for the robot to eat, if you will. That's a good point. I actually never thought about it in, in that angle, but it really makes sense. I mean, uh, whatever you invest currently into uh, data, quality, uh, data quality management, 
eventually it's going to pay off in AI as well, if you're going to use it, of course. Absolutely. And I think over time, everybody will be using it. <laughs> One last thing that I want to touch on uh, is that owner also that you mentioned earlier, right? So would you say that it is the owner who becomes responsible uh, for maybe setting the bar of of data quality? Like, is it the owner who is setting the bar? Is it the producer of the data? Is it the consumer of the data? Do you have any guidelines there for us? There are different ways how you can actually um, aggregate together. So it's actually possible even, let's say, to, to aggregate data quality to a level of a policy or to a level of standard which is linked to a particular data asset or, or business rule or data quality rule. So uh, there are indeed different stakeholders. So at the policy level, it's not maybe, probably it's not the data owner who cares about the overall quality, but more it's like compliance officer maybe, or let's say a chief data officer of a company or somebody who is owner of that policy. So wants to understand in which extent the company data or company is compliant with respect to a policy. But of course, then you have a specific data assets as well. Uh, which are linked to that policy. What I'm trying to say is that uh, one data object may be linked to different higher level assets which set additional constraints. So you might have, let's say, data retention policy where a set of requirements to the data are coming. And then you have, let's say, um, some regulations which are, let's say, coming from regulators and your data need to comply with those as well. So eventually what it means is that the data owner is typically responsible for quality of particular data object or particular type of a data, but you have other stakeholders who actually have a bigger picture maybe in mind as well. And then it's about setting up your, let's say, data governance structure to understand who is going to drive it. Is it the, is it the data owner or is it, let's say, uh, some C-level executive or is it some SME who knows about business rules in certain area? and gets feedback in, in which sense uh, certain business rule is uh, implemented uh, in the systems. Right. So ultimately, uh, it could be decided on a lower level, maybe an individual system level in a more limited case by an SME. And uh, on the other side of the equation or the spectrum, it could be go all the way up to a C level at the policy uh, aspect, which makes a lot of sense. Any last recommendations for the audience? Um, if they have to take one thing away with respect to data quality, what is one piece of advice you would give to them? I've always been fascinated about the data. I, I started, let's say, uh, 20, 30 years ago in discipline and always been fascinated thereabout. So one thing kind of keep in mind is when you are measuring data quality is that uh, data is generated as a result of running your business. So whatever data you have, it tells a lot about your business itself. And uh, measuring data quality can be used in order to measure a business as well. So, for instance, if you want to monitor whether your business is compliant to certain regulations, you can do it via data as well. It's not only that you have, let's say, data requirements coming from regulations, but you can measure in which extent your company's uh, business processes are compliant to uh, let's say, additional business rules, which either come from, let's say, internal policies or, or external regulations or maybe some, some other assets. So this is something that I think is very important to understand in, in data quality management is it's not only about the data, it's about the business. And if you understand that, then everything falls into place. 